Hello. Hi. It's, <laughs> it's May 2016 and May 27th, 2016 here in the United States. And it is episode 52 of the Unseen Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Carr. And with me tonight on our Bring Your Own Topic episode is a new panelist, Chris Prophet. Hi. Hi there. Chris, why don't you give us a, a very short summary of, of who you are and what you do? Right. Okay. I'm an author. Uh, I've just produced uh, a book about SpaceX. A uh, pretty important topic as it's right there in the uh, forefront of space development at the moment. Uh, in fact, they're probably doing more than anybody else at the moment to open up space. Uh, and that's what the book's all about. It's called Space SpaceX from the ground up. Uh, okay, so what do you want to know? Uh, just the short summary, who is Chris Prophet? Okay, well, <laughs> that's my pen name. Uh, I've done loads of things. Uh, I started off uh, as a semiconductor fabrication uh, design engineer and I've just run the gam gamut basically of all the different jobs you can do uh, but my main interest is, is space at the moment and of course writing so uh, I'm I'm UK based I don't know if you can tell that from my uh, accent oh no I was thinking Ohio okay oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lovely. yeah uh, and we have another writer with us tonight David Grigg Hi, hi, rolling from Australia. And I'm sure everybody who's listened to this podcast before knows who David is. And also with us tonight is Marsha Barnhart. Hello, everybody. And Patrick Festa. Hello again from the Jersey Shore. And Marsha and, Bar Marcia and Patrick have been with us many times before. So uh, you can read their bios. We have a panelist page on, at unseenpodcast.com. Anything you want to know about this podcast, you can find out at unseenpodcast.com. And if you're still not happy with what you know, which is unlikely, uh, email at email unseenpodcast at gmail.com and we'll answer any of your questions. So let's get started. This is Bring Your Own Topic Night. And Chris Prophet, you brought your own topic. Let us hear what you have to say. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I'll give you a quick rundown on SpaceX, what they're doing at the moment. Uh the company is very uh, novel approach to uh, space exploration. I mean, we've had problems in the uh, preceding years that there's just not enough money in the NASA budget to do everything they want to do. Uh, to go to Mars, it's going to be a you know, 10 times more expensive maybe than the moon. So there's just not enough money there to do that or not do it very quickly. So, in any case, uh, Elon Musk is uh, an interesting fellow. I'm sure you all heard of him. Mm -hmm. uh, when he came out of PayPal, uh, he sold the company, had some money. He went onto the NASA website to see what they're doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mars, and he couldn't find that they actually had much of a plan <laughs> running at that time. So he, uh, he said, well, why don't we look uh, at the, what's possible because his background is physics so he goes back to first uh, first principles so right to get to Mars what do we need well what do NASA need so NASA need uh, they need a company to build the rocket <laughs> that's the most basic thing so he said well okay well why can't I make a company to build that rocket to go to Mars and uh, that's essentially what he's done he, he's built a company from the ground up with the sole intention of getting there to Mars and building that rocket. So uh, it's it's very incisive. You think, well, how can a single company just do that? They're on their own, they have limited resources. But uh, again, he's taking it from uh, first principles. The fact that uh, you uh, to build a rocket, it's very expensive to go to Mars. Or, or another way of looking at that is you could make the expense of the rocket less. Uh, if you can make it less expensive than the money you have available, you can actually use that same money to uh, build the same vehicle. But you have to bring the cost down by a factor of 10 or even 100. 
which is essentially what he's been doing with SpaceX. He's got it down to about uh, 10 times cheaper, and he's heading towards 100 cheaper with his reusable rockets, which is... Uh, has anybody seen the rocket landings? Oh, yeah, the uh, on... th third in a row tonight, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Actually, I think it's number four. It's uh, the fourth they, they one, snuck... but third, third in a row, right? Yeah, third, third in a row. That's right. They, they, they uh, had one on land, but that wasn't difficult enough for them. They uh, said, "All right, we're going to start landing them out in the middle of the ocean on an automated uh, spaceport drone ship." So that's really interesting. Really yeah. clever. You stuff. know what? I have to say, I really. Uh, they named that ship. Of course, I still love you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which sh shows a certain amount of spirit. <laughs> yeah, I like, after I like the that. Ian ba uh, Banks novel. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it. Yeah, he, he, he uh, he's very widely read, uh, and uh, he he likes to make his references to Elon. But uh, the main thing is, it's not Elon's company. It's it's everybody who works there, SpaceX. They they all sort of. It's very sort of cooperative, and uh, and I, I I like what they're doing. <laughs> I like what they're saying. Um, They've worked out so far about two of the four techniques, the key techniques they're going to need for the run on Mars. And uh, it seems a bit fanciful for them to go to Mars, but at the moment they've got a mission penciled in for uh, NET 2018 to send a unmanned uh, mission to Mars, and they're just paying for that themselves. Now, they've told NASA, of course. <laughs> NASA is very interested in all the uh, information. Yeah, I was surprised by the NASA response. It was, mm. oh my goodness, that's great. Instead, instead of uh, you know competition, we don't like competition. But it was more, it was more. That's great. We hope we can help somehow. <laughs> you know? mm. Which, yeah. which is, uh, a cha a I think, a cultural change in. Na We're seeing a cultural shift in NASA right now. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, NASA want to go to Mars, SpaceX want to go to Mars, and they're, they're building the rocket. So I'm sure they can find some middle ground that, uh, you know, they can go there together, basically. Uh, of course, if NASA can find some money to uh, help SpaceX out and uh, help them build that big rocket, the one they're calling uh, MCT, Mars Colonial Transporter, uh, well, that's actually the spacecraft, which is the second stage of the rocket, and uh, uh, the whole rocket we have a code name, which is BFR, well, which is Big yeah. F Rocket. <laughs> After uh, the BFG. You can, you can cuss on this show. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> well, I prefer not to. I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, any questions? Did you score an interview with Elon or... or uh... Uh, no, no. Elon is pretty uh, tight on his time. He works about 100 hours a week uh, up and down uh, that, uh, let's see, uh, it's, your, it's your West Coast, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Of, of the US. It, he doesn't usually give interviews, but I've done, uh, I've been researching it for a couple of years and I found quite a lot of information that he's made and interviews and managed to put through put together a lot of his plan about how they're going to do this uh, Mars run. And it is quite, it's quite sublime. It's an elegant engineering solution he's come up uh, with to the problem of getting to Mars. As far as we could see at the moment, uh, he's going to have a big reveal in September of his architecture for this. So <laughs> what we know now to be, uh, or what we believe now is the case for his end the engineering on, on the MCT. When we get to September, it might have changed because every Monday morning they have a big meeting, a brainstorming meeting for uh, uh, how they're going to change the architecture. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah. Well, Chris, I have a question. I yeah? always, right. I always find it interesting um, why why they want to go to Mars. That is such a huge mm. endeavor. Why not a little baby step to the moon and figure out what isn't working and employ what is and then take that big leap? What's the deal there? Well, it's funny you should say that because uh, they have put this same question to Elon and he says, well, sure, if you have a rocket that can go all the way to Mars, then uh, why not just uh, send it to the moon, send it around the moon and just uh, make sure it's OK? I mean, this is a big problem they have with uh, rockets at the moment uh, and spacecraft. When you launch them, they have never been tested in space. So uh, it's the, you know, the first time you test them is when they get to space. So uh, 
but that is one problem that, that they're going to uh, fix on the MCT because it's designed to just basically be in space for a very long time. It's, you know, uh, they're talking about three and a half months to get to Mars and then three and a half months back. So it, it, it's, it's not a one shot vehicle. It's got to be there to stay, basically. Uh, so, yeah, go to the moon, go around the moon. Uh, they might not land because it's quite a different deal landing on the moon than is Mars. But <laughs> anything's possible with SpaceX. Well, it now, really is. It, it, my suspicion, uh, tell me if you think I'm wrong, is that a lot of what's going on that's reusable boosters and these, you know, flying the booster back mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. really about developing a supersonic, uh, you know, retro rocket, which would work on yeah. Mars. It's oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, these are the two of the four technologies that uh, are key uh, enablers to getting to Mars. One of them is uh, called supersonic uh, retro propulsion, which is when you hit the uh, atmosphere, you fire the rockets in the opposite direction to travel to slow you down. That is quite something on its own. It seems uh, normally if you hit the atmosphere, engines down, you have a shock wave created in front of the rocket, uh, and uh, that's right next to the nozzles. But if you can uh, put in some super supersonic retro propulsion, that shock wave is kicked out away from the rocket, and it forms almost like a... Uh, a virtual heat shield. It keeps the heat away from the rocket, and depending on how you uh, uh, modulate those uh, the firing, you can actually angle it so it becomes like a virtual wing, the shock wave, and you can ride it all the way down to the surface for a precise landing. That's one of the one of the critical technologies they're working out now. They're they're doing uh, experiments in the upper atmosphere, uh, which is very similar to the Mars atmosphere uh, because it's so diffuse. Mm -hmm. diffuse. Uh, that's the, the the one key technology. The other key technology, of course, is the uh, propulsive landing, uh, and they seem to be <laughs> doing great guns on that as well. Uh, as you've seen, they landed one uh, just just uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, if you see <laughs> on, the you see the fast. video, it's very impressive mm. how fast how fast it comes down and just gracefully oh. stops. It, it, uh, yeah. Well, you... the, go on. These are the really tough missions they're doing at the moment. I mean, they landed on land, but it wasn't wasn't hard enough for them. So what they're doing is now basically just dropping it from orbit, and then just as it, guiding it in with the grid fins, and then just as it's about to land, they fire all three rockets, and what some people call a suicide burn. Other people uh, they they call it hover slam, hover slam, and they just kill the uh, kill the velocity in the last three seconds before they hit the, well before they land on the barge <laughs> yeah it's very impressive it's like pulling uh, a punch right uh, you yeah uh, if <laughs> those, those of us who've practiced martial arts know that you can oh, uh, yes. with some experience you can you can pull a punch right at the last second um, now was that technology something that nasa had like like bigelow bought out a nasa patent on on a habitat uh inflatable habitat is that technique is something that NASA had and decided uh, to not try? I mean, did this guy think of that himself? No. Uh, that NASA didn't have it. NASA does not build rockets. That's something that people don't so know. So none of their engineers discussed how how they could use a, a propulsion system to land like that. Well, they might have discussed Who it. Who came but, up with that? But they might have discussed mm. it. I'm sure the whole community has been talking about it for decades, but I mean, it seems revolutionary. Uh, but, Who thought uh, of it? You know, every rocket in the U.S. inventory right now is built by, is built by a private contractor. Uh, there's no there's no government rocket. Uh, surely, surely, landing a rocket vertically like that is goes back as far as Robert Heinlein and, and earlier in in Pulp SF. You, you oh, see it yeah. on the covers of covers of any number of science fiction magazines from from that era. It's just that Elon Musk has managed to actually do it, which yeah. is pretty. And D D wild. the DCX, I went with that back in the '90s, I think, mm. uh, was a was a rocket that went up and came back down, but it didn't have this hypersonic retro capability, which is the key to being able to do that. And that's the t that's the sophisticated new technology. Everything mm -hmm. else they're doing is really just an application of modern control systems and the fact that we have really fast computers now that you can put it into, into a, something the side of, size of a pack of cards. And, yeah. And, was, uh, 
Was that your question, David? I, I, was, I was. No, no, it wasn't my question. If, if, if I can, the question I wanted to ask, which I'm not sure that Chris can answer, uh, is really it's interesting that we have a a a, 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 a commercial company, co commercial entity here, uh, starting to look at uh, landing a craft on another another planet. And I wonder what the legal implications of that are. I mean, what what's uh, is is that something people have really understood yet? Um, there, I know there are all sorts of treaties that that still are in existence, but um, ah. I mean, is oh, that's must a good question. Those kind of treaties. We need Liam Ginty what? for that one. He's, he's uh, he knows more about the outer space treaty than I do. But uh, yeah, I mean, the the there are treaties, but they're pretty broad and it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. I don't think the uh, my understanding of the outer space treaty does not prohibit us from going to another planet. Uh, now the NASA NASA has what they call a planetary protection office, which is mm -hmm. going to be concerned about protecting the pristine environment on Mars, which we've already actually done some violence to, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, with but um, because you know, well maybe I shouldn't get into that in, de in any detail, but uh, there's there have been conflicts between the NASA planetary protection office and project offices at JPL. But, uh, yeah, they will have to, if they're going to land on Mars, they're going to have to spend some time in D.C. talking to NASA. I, I can have a crack at that one if you want. Uh, th that is covered in my book, the uh, OST, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, implications. Um, I mean, basically, uh, as I understand it, the uh, the government <laughs> that uh, of of the company because the company is registered with specific gov governments and states um, that government is responsible for the landing even if it's carried out by a company and at the moment the lawyers at SpaceX are uh, have in in depth discussions with uh, the American government about what it is they should actually agree because nobody's actually done this before so they're still setting the like guidelines about okay what what do you need to say to us and what do we need to answer to you in, in return about uh, this landing uh, oh, I, I'm sure there will be there will be more paper written about you know a higher stack of paper about that than there mm. is about everything else in the, <laughs> in, in the program uh because the lawyers will get involved, um, and I mean, it, yeah, it's it's a really tr tricky one because, uh, to be honest, the Outer Space Treaty is aspirational. It's something where the uh, international uh, community have agreed. Well, this is what we'd like to try and do in space, but uh, how much it's actually uh, becomes uh, realised? Well. It's probably going to be quite a bit, considering uh, the responsibility of the of the U.S. government in this regard. So, yeah, it's going to be very interesting how this uh, plays out. Patrick, yeah. do you have a question for Chris? Yeah, um, I was going to ask Chris. You know, I I missed the last couple of landings, um, and I'm going to have to catch them on video. I hope they're on video somewhere. Oh yes, they are. Uh, from what I understand, from what I can tell, uh, they've been very successful in the last two or three or four now. Mm. Um, so. Was it was it a design change or a material fix, a combination of both, or was it a procedural change that they managed to successfully do it after the uh, first couple of um, 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 you know semi failures? Well, yeah, uh, all all of the above. Uh, I understand there's a guy called Lars Blackmore who's a is a Brit who's sort of in charge of the software and uh, he, he's. Obviously, they've done a lot of work with the software. You can see uh, the first landing at sea that they actually nailed. It came on. A, it came in at a big, big angle because there was like 30 to 50 mile an hour winds, and it just uh, came over the ASDS, the automated spaceport drone ship, and then just straightened up at the last moment and dropped straight on it. So obviously, they've done an awful lot of work on the software. And of course, they've done various things on the on the grid fins, giving it more hydraulic fluid. And I mean, uh, this is the thing about uh, SpaceX: they don't just look at one problem; they just fix one thing and then uh, and, and then hope it works. They look at the whole gamut of everything that's happened and just get it improve everything that they're doing uh, in, in a landing. Uh, it's quite heartening, really, to see 
how professional and effective they are at uh, approaching these problems. Yeah. I mean, everybody must have seen the early landings. They were quite spectacular, but uh, they turned it around quite quite, uh, quite effectively. It took them a few times, but uh, yeah, but, it's a toughie. Yeah, yeah, I'm old enough to remember the old sci-fis where they you know, showed the, the black and white film showing the rocket landing and then, then taking off again and all that stuff. So mm. when, when uh, SpaceX brought that, that rocket that actually did that, it was kind of a nostalgic thing for me. And seeing the first one uh, uh, getting blown sort of sideways by the wind and then and then crumpling you know cr crumpling on one one leg, it was uh -oh. disheartening to say Jason. the least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know that yeah. that some of that is just the way engineering is normally done. But that, what I think is is uh, been bold about what SpaceX has done is they accepted that they would have failures early on. Mm. And they, Absolutely, they, and, and they did not. They you know Leon Musk was tweeting. You know, we think it's maybe a 50 50 chance the landing will work. He, he never said, you know, and and yes, you know, they so they they managed expectations well, but they also were willing to accept that, okay, you know, the main mission is getting that satellite into space or that, you know, and then and then this the test is see if we can land on the barge or land on land on the ground. And if it fails, it fails, and if it fails, we'll have lots of data that we can learn from. So it was just like the MythBusters. Failure is always an option, hmm. right? Right, uh, right. If we Which get how if, works, if we right? get data, it's a it's a good thing. So, well, that's how science works, right? right. You, know, you, you take your failures and you well, learn from engineering them. Engineering works that way too. Uh, you know, we, uh, but in a lot of organizations, a failure would be too embarrassing and too difficult to justify. So. Uh, the thing, admirable thing about SpaceX is they say, is Elon Musk didn't say, I'm going to fire you if this thing doesn't land on the barge, right? He never said that. He said, if it, land, if it fails to land on the barge, take data and let's find out how we can fix it rather than, right. rather than, you know, right. which is, which is, which is one of the main things that's wrong with, with a lot of the, you know, technical companies in this country. It's, it's wrong with the, some of the education system too, is because they put, great expectations on people who are trying to do something they've never done before. And uh, uh, if, if it fails, the, uh, it's your fault. You're fired. You know, that's, that's just wrong. That's just well, wrong. I mean, I, I, I might accept that for like a baseball manager, you know? <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Yeah. But I, mean, I, I don't, I don't see it for, you know, when you're trying to do something at the frontier of human capability. Right. right. I mean, baseball has uh, been around for, you know, yeah. You know, it, it, time it, and we think we know how it works. Now. If you don't get, <laughs> make a 500 records, you're, you're out and then we'll get another guy. Right. But, uh, or, you know, in, in European soccer, it's like, if you don't win a whole bunch of championships, uh, we'll find somebody right. else to pay $5 million a year to come in and, and do this job. Right. So, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it's a question of, of really having a a new vision. Well, it's also just the the understanding that risk is real, and risk is not, and we're not going to get rid of risk, and we're not going to get rid of failure. Failure is going to happen, and we're not going. And safety is never perfect. And if we really want to go to Mars, somebody's going to die. Yeah. You know, I find myself wondering um, if maybe there will be more competition. I mean, uh, SpaceX, that company has about 4,000 employees. I think NASA has about 18,000. And I'm thinking, you know, what if some other company uh, decides to do something similar? I wonder what that would look like. Talk about a space race. Good question. I, I think it would actually be healthy. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually kind of happening already, but... Between countries, oh. I mean. Well, there's Jeff, there's Jeff Bezos's oh, yeah. Blue Origin. China probably. Uh, yeah, China. Well, China, China as a nation is is definitely has their eyes on the moon. Oh, yeah, they're crazy into it. Uh, they would like to go to Mars. They know how hard it is, and they're they don't feel ready, which is actually probably pretty realistic on their part. Yeah, uh, and uh, they have talent. They have the talent. They have tons of talent. Uh, they but talent isn't the whole picture. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. if, well, it, if, it, yeah. if it were, then uh, you know, then then China and Russia would, would rule the world, and they would because uh, they have the most talent. Uh, yeah. But it, it's also organization and and 
and your the approach you take and the willingness to take risks and to fail. Now, if you're a Chinese bureaucrat in charge of the space agency, can you accept a failure? Well, mm-hmm. you, you couldn't if you were in North Korea, but you could probably live through it. Yeah, well, you might China. live through it, but you might not be in the same job yeah. ne- next week. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're changing in that country, too, how they approach things. Uh, they are understanding this type of... Um, way of thinking more and more, I'd say, well, which you know, you know, well, is making uh, them a real competition. Japan, the Japan Space Agency, which has a tiny fraction of the budget of NASA, mm-hmm. has successfully taken on big risks, mm. risky missions, and uh, mm. and failed sometimes and succeeded other times. But uh, I think they've got a culture now where you're not in a big trouble if, if you take on a big risk and have a big failure. Yeah, uh, you aren't falling on your sword anymore. No, it's not that anymore. It, 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 they, you know, with the Hayabusa mission, and also with the recent, I'm probably sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, Akusaki mission to Venus, where they somehow salvaged that mission after uh-huh. lots yeah. of heroic efforts. Yeah, uh, that was, you know, they now that have really the, showed that that showed their metal. It showed their metal. It also showed. That uh, you know, in Japanese Japan Space Agency, um, we we care more about showing your medal than we care about perfection. A- and uh, they are now going out to another asteroid and trying to do. They'll probably return a sample before we do. And uh, so that that's uh, that's interesting that that. What we, you know, here in the U.S., what we perceive as a very rigid culture in Japan is actually not quite that. It's there's it's more, uh, it's more flexible than we think, and you know, they le- maybe learned a lot of their lessons from, from their defeat in World War II and, and the humiliation they suffered there. Um, so, uh, anyway, it's time to move on. Uh, thanks, Chris. That that's really good discussion. We should probably get into it more in some yeah. future episode. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, maybe we'll have a bit more in future episodes as they are moving things on all the time, I suppose. Yes, so. uh, yeah. I, I guess it's David's turn for his topic. Okay. Um, well, I guess this was this, this was triggered by my reading uh, an article about uh, huge simulations that are now being done on, on cities, um, things which simulate uh, the traffic flow, which have been around for quite some time. But uh, now trying to simulate um, movement of people as well, the uh, use of electricity as well, um, and uh, and so on. Um, and so I, I started to think about the use of simulations, and um, one of the um, one of the very interesting things I think which has happened over the last mm, what 20, 30 years has been the increasing use of computers to do science uh, by running simulations. And it just, um, so I started to think about that, and I was, I was thinking about the, the city simulation, for example, and thinking, well, you can have a very complex uh, traffic simulation, but how do you take into account the, the random things that random things that might happen? You know, someone slips on a banana peel and falls in, into into the the road, and and the car hits them, and so the traffic is stopped for for an hour or two, or you know, those sort of random uh, events which happen in the real world, which you know, would be difficult to properly simulate in uh, a simulation. And so then I started thinking about uh, the, 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 other sim- the other areas that simulations are used in and just how that matches up with how we understand that science is done. I suppose one of the most interesting ones these days is the, um, is the use of simulations to simulate the entire universe and uh, how, uh, how the, uh, the dark matter uh, that we think is there has... Uh, shaped the way that the structure of, of the universe has evolved. And uh, there's some very interesting work being done, but it, I do, as, as someone who used to write software myself, I do sort of look at that and I, I kind of wonder, well, you know, you're, you're developing a simulation which matches up with uh, what you can see out there, but is, is that really telling you uh, a great deal about the science? Uh, it, you know, it, so, software is... Um, uh, software is is inherently uh, uncertain and full of you know potentially full of bugs 
it's based on a whole lot of assumptions that you're making about about uh, uh, things about and there are rounding errors. You know, how does all this come together to give us something which we can then say is a piece of science? Uh, and I've, uh, there's, there's actually a whole lot of uh, stuff on the web uh, uh, which discusses the whole philosophy of this. Uh, and um, so I, I suppose my question is just throwing it up into a discussion is, uh, is the use of simulations in science a valid thing? Is, is it a good thing? Is it teaching us stuff we, we wouldn't otherwise know? Um, or are we just sort of kind of reinforcing the assumptions that we build into, into the software that we write? I don't know. It's just just an open topic for discussion, I guess. What I'd like think? to start. I'd like to start. I I think it's a combination of both. I mean, uh, being a Star Trek fan, this is something that they do all the time. Um, the idea of using simulations is not to get a verbatim um, idea. It's it's a uh, it's a sort of a first step you take to see if this might work, and uh, you you would, you test it in in a software situation. You're in, in a computer simulation. But then sooner or later, you do actually have to test it in the real world, and you you have to make sure that you don't have any uh, um, biases, you know, to great expectations. Oh, it worked in the computer simulation. Why shouldn't it work? And you can't do that. You have to you have to say, well, okay, it worked in a computer simulation. Now let's uh, let's test it in the real world and see what differences we get. And then and then you turn around and you find out the differences, and you add those differences to that same computer uh, program, and 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 you carry on from there. But there are, like you said, there are those who put too much um, um, weight into the simulation and don't pay attention to the real world. Well, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Validation is very important, right? I mean, you, you have to you have to sanity check everything. Uh, now, in my my field, I've seen simulations work wonderfully well. Um, in particular, uh, you know, a lot of things we do in, in the space field, we can't really test on the ground. The only mm -hmm. way to, because we don't have, we have gravity, we have, we have, well, gravity is the, the biggest problem. Uh, <laughs> we don't, we're not moving at seven and a half kilometers per second. We're, there's a lot of things that, that are not like space. And so we have to simulate them. And it turns out that if you put the effort in, and numerics are part of that, you know, making sure the rounding errors don't don't bite you, uh, which, by the way, that's very, there's very sophisticated approaches to that. Uh, I I'm not worried about that one so much, but uh, the you you can write simulations if you're careful, and if you get a lot of careful review and validate them as well as you as well as possible, that actually do do a good job of simulating how a system will perform in that environment. Now, it's pretty limited scope, right? It's not simulating the entire universe. But let's say we are doing that simulation of the entire universe with dark matter and everything. We have tons of observations. And we're getting more every day of the very deep universe. And we should be able to compare those models to what we see in, in, in the observations. And if we can't match the observations, we know we haven't got a good model. And, sure. and yeah, well, they, they've done that with, with, oh, it was a supernovas or was it, uh, uh some other uh, galaxy collisions, et cetera. They, they've done, they, they had to go back and, and, and after their simulations didn't show a star forming, um, star formation, they, they had to go back and say, hey, what are we doing wrong? What are we missing? And they actually learned how something works. Well, in, in yeah, astrophysics there are two, by trying their yeah. simulation. There are two schools of thought on that. One is good. One is bad. One is, Oh, our fudge factors are wrong. Let's tweak our fudge factors till we match the yes. data better. <laughs> that, that's what worries me. That's exactly what worries me, I suppose. But if you, you know. say let's let's tweak our let's let's adjust our understanding. Now there are fudge factors, even in the most fundamental theories of physics. Sure. There, I can't remember how many. I think it's something like twenty nine uh, constants in the standard model of physics that are empirically determined. Then you determine them by running experiments and you measure them. Uh, rather than, and that's one we of the things that, theory. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can't derive them from theory. Yeah. We can't derive them be, uh, either because our theory is not good enough yet, or because we'll never be able to derive them. That just how the universe behaves. Uh, nobody knows the answer to that question yet, but, and that's what, it's, that's what a lot of things that motivate string theory, string theory 
thinks that if they get sophisticated enough, they can they can calculate all the constants. <laughs> well, but of course, but they haven't done that, so you know nobody knows if that's possible or not. But uh, the 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 thing that we have is, you know. You can you can build models in with lots of fudge factors, and every, everybody who's done modeling has done this. And you can say, well, we will tweak these fudge factors to match the data we have. Uh, this is just like neural networks, or you know what they call machine learning. They they can it has lots of fudge factors. Basically, machine learning is all fudge factors. It's all, it's all you know it's all constants that need to be adjusted, and. As the data comes in, you adjust and adjust and adjust and adjust, and you learn and then you learn. But then there's some, something called overfitting, where you've got yes. you've got your fudge factors fitting the the training set perfectly, but then get out of the real world and some noisy, ugly data comes in, and and you know the the machine that knows to know what to do with it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of exactly what I'm thinking. I mean, it, it comes down to that to phrase. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the guy's name properly, but Alfred Kozibski, the map is not the territory. Uh, and and that, that's quite a nice analogy, I think, in that, that you can have a beautiful map of, of uh, somewhere where you're going to go hiking, and it shows a huge amount of detail, but you sort of start off and you walk down the path, and suddenly... A tree has fallen down, been blown down by the wind of the, overnight, and that's not on the map. So you have to go around it. You know, so so it, it's just this whole business of of the map between um, a theoretical model and, and reality. And l looking at the this this uh, huge um, simulation, um, uh, is it uh, it's called the millen the millennium simulation of of the of development of cosmo of the cosmological development of the universe. The uh, that uses uh, something like ten to the ten particles uh, to, to work out uh, where things are going to go and that the uh, attraction between them and so on. But each particle is about a billion solar masses and it's not it's not exactly a, a, a fine grained no. simulation. So, so th th that's obviously an area where there must be a disconnect between reality and, and the simulation. Well, yeah, but sometimes the fine grained simulations can actually produce meaningful results. It, it depends on how you know, where the effect, where the important effects are, what scale the important effects are happening, right? Uh, and uh, I work with weather modelers every day, and they are incredibly sophisticated. They model, um, they model everything there is about the Earth's atmosphere that that's known to man, right? <laughs> that that can possibly affect weather, and they are really good at it. And they have extreme, but there's no one definitive model. There, there are many models. And if you're trying to, say, determine the track of a hurricane, uh, you'll have about six or seven models that will all predict a, a slightly different track. But, but it, 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 isn't that how it works, though? It's, it's a statistical ap approach. You, you, they basically simulate a, a thing and, and come up with a, a you know, hundred different possibilities. Well, and, and I think then, what, what then, they do, then, then they can look at this, the, the, the statistical, you know, the likelihood is that in 40% of those simulations, this will happen in 60% well, simulations that will happen. You're talking about like it's, a Monte Carlo simulation, which yeah, well, with, su right. super it, computer, have, with supercomputer simulations, that's often prohibitively expensive. You know, you have to run the model thousands of times or hundreds of times. Uh, with some simulations, it's it's easy. You know, you, you can run the model a thousand times in an hour. Uh, with I think with weather models, uh, weather models have two issues. One is they're constantly ingesting new data because there are satellites flying over the world all the time, many 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 of them, and they are bringing in temperature and pressure and moisture profiles of the atmosphere. Uh, everywhere you go, plus images and so on. And all this gets ingested into the computers and they have to constantly update the uh, the calculation of the weather prediction. But there are, I, I can't remember the exact number, there's something like eight or nine models that are still in competition with each other for 
and, and if there's a listener out there who knows the facts, please set us straight. But there's European models and there's, there's Asian models and there's U.S. models and there are different U.S. models. And each model will predict the track of a storm slightly differently or the amount of rainfall, for example, or uh, you know, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the, uh, the measurement of interest is. And it's, but the good thing about weather modeling is you get a correction every day. Right? You, get sure. re, you get reality all the time. If you predict two inches of rainfall and you get five inches, okay, you made a mistake, right? Something's mm-hmm. wrong in the model. Well, you know, David's original postulation was, is this good? Is this actually science? If you're running a bunch of simulations, is this actually science? And it seems to me we've pretty much answered, yeah, it is. It is a form of science and it is something just like weather modeling that will get better and better over time as you learn how to tweak it. And not only is it good science as as um, a tweaking model, but also the science that comes out of running simulations and computing power and you know there's just all these different things that would take into account how to run better simulations i think it is science and i think it's getting to be more and more important uh trying to figure out how things work well i think you're right marcia but i i I think that it's always been part of science and you have to be able to calculate what your hypothesis predicts and as we've gotten more complexity that calculation of what our hypothesis predicts becomes more, and we have more computing power, becomes more and more involved, more and more complicated, and more and more, you know, we have to start taking into account errors. There's, there are errors in our basic knowledge and there's errors in our measurements, right? Mm. And uh, so, but that's part of science, right? We, we take the hypothesis, we pr- produce a range of where the measurements could come out. Then we have to go do the measurements. And the reason I brought up weather is we do the measurements every, probably every 10 seconds or so. We do the measurements all the time. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it's and from the hits and misses. Sorry. It's interesting that you use weather as an example because it was the simulation of, of weather patterns, which was the, the origin really of the, the interest in chaos theory where we found that very small, very, very small differences in our original knowledge or the original information we put in blow up into huge, huge changes, not very far down track. So uh, I, I, guess, I guess all I'm arguing for is, is a, bit of, um, a bit of hubris, a bit of, a bit of uh, yeah, I think this is a bit of hubris in there. I think, I think we need a bit more modesty right. about well, what these models tell us. Yeah, but I mean, I think, since then, there's been a huge improvement in how we, well we understand chaos. Uh, well, I've actually seen, you know, uh, during, for example, major hurricanes in this area that were coming about. Um, I was very surprised to see, with some of the latest satellites that were up there, where where the weather per, the weather reporter uh, meteorologist um, would stand there and tell you know, on national TV, tell them, you know, this is this these are five different tracks of the storm according to our simulations or five or even six for that matter. I don't know, I forget how many there were. And and they were saying that they think this model is the right one. And the point was, you know, the point being for, for this conversation was that they actually had several simulations where there, there was several different tracks. You know, one went this way, one went this way, and there was like a couple of them in between. And and they basically averaged them out. And, and the final result was close to the average. But but that is it's a good it's a valid point. In other words, it's not like they're depending on any one particular model. They they were actually looking at several models and several different uh, uh, scenarios. Yeah, well, you can go back to 1950, right? Uh, imagine you're there, right? Uh, they wouldn't even know the hurricane was coming. They they get they right. get a, a stress call from a ship at sea saying, "Wow, waves are really high here. Winds are really high," or they they'd get something a radio radio from a buoy, and they would say, "Oh, well." Out to sea, the winds are high, and and uh, but we have no idea where that the storm is going to hit. We know there's a storm out there. We don't even know how powerful it is. We don't know which way it's moving. Uh, and now we not only have better models, but we have much, much more data. 
we fly, we have planes and boys and satellites flying over that storm all the time. And so we know we can predict a much, much smaller strip of land where that hurricane is going to make landfall. Right. Uh, right. And so we don't have to evacuate the entire Florida coast. We can evacuate, you know, maybe 50 miles of it. And, and that is a huge improvement. And it's a lot of science went into that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not denying that that, that simulations are incredibly valuable. Um, in fact, we we found out some amazing things based on on um, uh, on the use of computer simulations. Uh, the the other example I didn't have the chance to bring up before was the formation of the solar system, and the, the whole development of the of the Nice model and uh, the idea of the Grand Tech. That the the uh, the major planets like Jupiter and Saturn moved significantly uh, in, in the early days of the solar system in and out from the sun. Um, I mean, th that's fascinating. I, yeah. I'm fascinated by this whole thing. Um, but but I just I just I'm just interested as a as a software person myself uh, of of you know where, where the the edge is of, of these things. And I, I, I guess we just we just can't. Um, we can't even get to the point where we believe that the map is the territory. That we we, we just need to uh, to uh, always have a bit of um, a, a bit of modesty in, in, in how we apply this model. So that that was really the, the scope of, mm -hmm. of what I wanted to okay. explore today. Okay. So if you want to pass on to another topic, that would be well. I think fun. that that's that's something we could explore for a long time. But uh, let's yeah, let's move on to Marsha's topic. Well, I brought up. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about CRISPR because I think it's really revolutionizing things. And um, I find it quite fascinating. A lot of people have heard about CRISPR, but, you know, it's kind of, what is it? And quickly, it's a, CRISPR, Cas9 is what CRISPR really is. And it's just more commonly called CRISPR, but it's a gene editing process. And it was discovered by biochemists. It, the CRISPR is actually an acronym, and it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Yeah, this is so, something that bacteria really invented, right? Uh, yeah, they found it bacteria, yeah, streptococcus mainly. Now, they what they found is um, these, these segments, these exact same encoded segments seem... I'm sorry, Marsha, we lost... Marsha, repeat that. We just lost you for a few seconds. Uh, okay, they they found the found clusters almost regularly, and the the clusters had the same read forward and backward, which is why they called them palindromic repeats. So that really piqued um, the researchers' interest, and they found that that it's a process that a bacteria uses to edit DNA and potentially remove anything that, you know, mainly it was viruses. When they found a virus, it would come in and use this process to cut the virus out. Um, it's two-pronged, this system. It uses RNA to home in on this specific stretch of DNA, and then an enzyme that they named Cas9 to cut, snip, snip. So basically, CRISPR-Cas9 helps to snip out a piece of DNA at any point in an organism, and then it enables the cell to stitch the ends back together. And it was just a remarkable process that was found inherent in bacteria, as you were saying, Paul. And, and apparently, they were thinking this creates the bacteria's ability to intervene in the replication of harmful virus activity within its DNA. And so... That's what got the researchers' attention and started them really digging into what they were observing here. Now, observing this amazing, clean, simple, yet elegant, relatively accurate and inexpensive gene editing capability that set the biomedical and genetic engineering communities into a frenzy. And then I found interesting that part of the CRISPR story, which segues into exactly who is credited with discovering CRISPR and when. And that has been just a, a brouhaha. It's a point that is in deep dispute. Some say um, the, the team of a French microbiologist, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier, and an American biochemist, Dr. Jennifer Doudna. They should be credited because in uh, 2012, June 28, 2012, Doudna's team published its results in science. 
And most importantly, one of Doudna's team members managed to find a way to combine the two short strands of RNA that were found in the CRISPR process in bacteria and merge them into one fragment. Now, this thing, this merging of two RNA together, they termed that the guide RNA, RNA, and that was huge. And so the guide RNA made the process even easier and more effective, and I think that was a true innovation, and, and that's what they included in their paper. But Having said that then, the CRISPR-Cas9 patent was actually granted to this uh, Chinese um, scientist at the Broad Institute, which is a research facility that's both Harvard and MIT affiliated, and this Dr. Feng Zhang uh, and his team, they, they heard about CRISPR-Cas9 and they immediately set to work working in mouse and human cells and everyone else they contend experimented in lower order bacteria cells. And so Zhang says his breakthrough in CRISPR, and his paper was published in 2013, he maintains that his team proved this process worked not in just bacteria or a test tube, like the other researchers were saying, but it works too in cells that have a nuclei. And so then they knew that that would work in human genomes. And so, uh, Another thing that everybody seems to be PO'd about was that his team accelerated their patent paperwork by paying an extra amount of money. Even though Doudna's paper got in earlier, Zheng's team paid an extra two or $3,000 in patent paperwork to accelerate this process, and they got the patent. Um, and so that resulted in a real patent war going on and somebody stands to make a gazillion dollars off this process as soon as the lawyers get done figuring out who that was. But then lastly, the point about CRISPR, I think, that is of interest is that it's going to have ethical considerations. Scientists at this time don't have any idea what further experimentation and research is going to bring about in okay, this field. Can, can we, okay, so the implication here is that you can edit uh, any gene in the human genome? Or, yes, or yes, yes, any gene. If you use this process, you can ask this RNA to know what it is to go and search. And along with that RNA, this guide RNA, comes accompanying this enzyme, this Cas9 enzyme. And they travel around as a duo while that guide RNA looks for this particular bit of uh, segmentation say that that's, that's a, they worked it with HIV. And so they found this HIV virus and then Cas9 said, okay, here's where it begins and here's where it ends. Snip, snip, cut, 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 and they pulled it out. They can also insert information in that segment that has been snipped. But yes, you can do that in a human embryo and you can do that in eggs and sperm. It's literally germline engineering at this point. So, so is the is the suggestion here? I think what you're saying is is that the implications can be uh, for for medical uh, uh, advances in in uh, uh, disease control and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the main thing they were thinking about. But of course, it can be used in agronomics. Um, uh, they're going to use it with you know uh, strains of corn and grain, and you uh, you can have huge uh, you can have huge um, what do you call that? Um, yields. Yields. Yeah, you can have yeah. huge yields because there there is no disease now. Uh, fungus won't get it and all that type of thing. So yes, it could be used in that. But the fact of the matter is that precise genome engineering truly has the potential to alter not just us, but literally the entire world and all the Earth's ecosystems. It has that kind of potential, and it's a case are we where talking like, are we talking like the pos possibility of uh, a sci-fi scenario of genetic engineering or genetically engineered? Oh, absolutely, humans? absolutely. That's what they're afraid of, and that's why there have been a fair amount of scientists clearly skittish about certain areas of research and applications. And there's a lot of discussion going on right now: how and where to self-police. Uh, it is, and and they don't even know that much about it yet and when they get to know what all they can do my god i mean it's it's the wild west out there and it's a, 
it's a well, gird your loins kind of thing. It's always been a wild west, right? I mean, we yes, it has. Yeah, we, we can't we can't stop we can't stop illicit activity. We've never we've never succeeded at that. That's true, uh, we and, and we've always been working with you know genes and how to make a better yield and and that type of thing. But but this probably takes that you know a hundredfold. Right now, now Marcia, yeah. I, I got I got a good analogy for you here, Marcia. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, they say that anything that can be made can be fixed. So uh, as we sort of discover what's going on with the uh, genes and what each gene does in each segment, then we're actually working out how how to make people essentially. So when we do that, and um, with this gene editing technique, well, we can fix anything. I mean. Healthcare just becomes a very minor problem compared to what you can do with this. I mean, you can literally do anything. It, it, potentially, you could cure any illness with it. it. It's that strong. But you've got to understand exactly how those genes express and what's in those uh, in, in that gene line, basically. So yes. it, the whole future is just huge. Yeah. yeah, unintended consequences are probably going to be the biggest thing. You know, you could run a bunch of Absolutely. simulations on that, David. Unintended yeah. consequences on that. Right. Yeah. Well, we don't really we we know. My understanding is that CRISPR Cas9 allows us to edit individual genes uh, with, I think, something like seventy percent accuracy. Uh, but it's getting better, Paul. Yeah. It okay. Is getting let's scary say let's say it gets to hundred percent accuracy. Yeah. Okay. Just for the sake of argument, uh, you still only you know only one gene at a time. The the reality is that many of our phenotypical traits come from multiple interacting genes. It's very it gets very complex very fast, uh, particularly things like intelligence. Yeah. So you have to be mm. extremely careful and doing well, you know, doing it in mice won't fix it. No, no, they're looking at mutations. Well, I know that I, I know I know that the people that are developing this have good yeah. intentions. They're, yeah. they're trying. They they know that there are many genetic diseases which can be fixed with a single gene or a, one or two genes. Uh, and yep. And but, the, but remember, it's it. You got to think bigger than that. That is not just fixing a gene. That's going in and telling a gene not to be affected by the next thing that tries to invade its cell nuclei. That that's really dwelling deep. Well, I, that's but, what I they mean, can do. What what a gene basically does is it instructs uh, instructs the construction of a protein, which Correct. is a, which is a very complex thing. Uh, well, actually, and um, and the, but the pro problem you know. is that that that, that uh, some of the things that we find. You know, it, it, the concern it, a lot of people have, which I'm not sure is really a problem, but people are concerned about designer babies, uh, about super soldiers, about, uh, you know, engineering a human that is obedient but highly capable. Um, I'm not so sure you can do that with gene editing, at least not in a straightforward way, uh, because when you start talking about these very high level traits, you're talking about a lot of uh, a real complex of genes and you're, you're the unintended consequences. Yeah. Are going to be massive. Uh, yeah. And you can't really right now, we don't have a way to do it on in mass. We can just do it in a one embryo at a time. So you, it, 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 it always, it has always struck me that this sort of editing uh, is is again? I'm bringing it back to a, a software point of view. But, but wait, I got to correct it's, it's, something here. Wait, wait, okay, I got to correct a misconception. You don't do it one embryo at a time. This you change the entire genome of, and they start spewing out babies that have this. You don't have to go to each individual little baby and no, do no. That. You'd have to do it. In the, you, you'd have to do it in in the gametes, which would be, which would you be. You can change what what traits. The children of your children of your children of your children have. It's that far reaching. Well, but yeah, I understand. I understand. Once I understand that, but no, no, you can't. You you can't take an adult and change all their genes. No, no, with no, this no, technique. But, you but, you have to go to the sex cells, and change a particular one, and then that that becomes a uh, particularly an embryo, like you know, a, a fertilized egg, and you can change that. But that's one baby at a time. 
You can't do it with the whole population. You can do it with the progeny of that which you have. But that that that's a whole generation. Well, now you're having five well, now kids. You're, now those you're five kids are having five kids. Enge- and those- engineering, engineering people to be able to live on a different planet other than Earth. Like or, or not just that, but for I mean, example, we're, we're going to Mars, and we're going to talk about being able to survive certain certain aspects. You know, you might be able to tweak certain uh, aspects. Well, you of- know, I really think that that's the way we're going to get to Mars. Is we're going to have designer babies that are. Martian babies that aren't mutated by all the radiation that's out there. Well, and they're the low atmosphere. The details I don't know, but the, well, the, the reality that's, is that that's the thing. you know, living uh, I, low, I low I gravity. Yeah, uh, it's Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, as soon as somebody lands on Mars, they're going to be in a completely different uh, environment, different gravity. Uh, there's probably going to be a uh, different atmospheric makeup to. Uh, our environment here uh it's there's going to be radiation certain amount of solar radiation so yeah there's going to be a lot of different stimuli on those people and uh one of the most interesting thing about uh, the the uh the cas9 the crispr stuff is that um you can just go around randomly changing uh, bits of your gene line and seeing what works or what doesn't but it it seems quite probable that there is uh, already existing strings in there which are what if scenarios what if there's an ice age what you know what genes will express then what if there's a uh, a, a, a huge drought in 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 uh, north africa say which is what caused uh, humans to actually leave africa i understand we went down to 15000 as the as the uh, minimum that there's ever been of humans on earth and then they decide to leave Africa and they'll see that a big, uh, uh, But that's uh, like adaption. epigenetics. You're talking epigenetics, right? How, mm. how, uh, how your environment is going to change your, your physical makeup, um, down to the DNA. And yes, that's, that's been taking place. Certainly it has mm. forever, but that's just a natural process that, um, the environment has on the, the human body and, and it makes it express certain characteristics in one environment that it would not in the other. But well, yeah, that, that, that's right. But what I'm saying is you, you can use CRISPR to stimulate those and, and, and make them express where they wouldn't oh, normally. Oh, so, yes. uh, you know, you've all you got various fixes in your sort of junk DNA, wherever it's stored, and you can say, okay, we're going to a different environment instead of waiting for two or three generations for it to express. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We're going to express true, right sure. now. Uh, and, you know, these fixes are already there, so they don't have to sort of mess around and just say, well, we'll try changing this and see what happens. That, that, as long oh, as they stay, what you're saying. Yeah. As long as they stay on piste uh, with the uh, these what-if scenarios, they could get quite a lot uh, uh, an effect out of CRISPR. But if they go off piste and start messing around with genes and finding what happens, well, things could get really interesting. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. They people don't even know the questions to ask yet. Mm. You know, they don't I mean, know what they're reading. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much, so much um, technology that is being found as people get more and more into this, and and tools that are being created for guide RNA to do very specific things, change eye color, and I mean, then you got a bunch of people who are sitting around, and literally, I heard. If you had a decent little home computer and home lab that, you know, a high level uh, third year biology college college student could start working tools to build guide RNA to sell to lab. And it's it's going to create also a lot of offshoot technologies, too. It's just it's an interesting area that is it's going to be interesting to see how it. It well, bio, biohacking out. is already a thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, mm. pe- people are already doing it. Uh, and it's not going to get smaller. Uh, no. We're starting to understand the machinery of, of, of life. Uh, and it's machinery. It's, it's chemistry. It can, it can be worked just like any other chemistry. And, uh, yeah, that, that Zhang, you know, uh, Dr. Feng Zhang, he, he, approach this in his mind because both his parents were computer geeks he approached it that he, he thinks biology is as programmable a system as computer programming is 
And that's how he's looking at it. And he could be right. It's not, it's a machine that can be programmed by engineering. This was the point I was going to make before, which is, which is that it seems to me that this is like uh, trying to reverse engineer a huge piece of software, uh, you know, say Microsoft Word or something, trying to reverse engineer it without any access to the source code. And you've got a, a vastly, vastly complex system going on. And, and all you can do is, is poke at little bits of it and, and maybe change a few bits and bytes here and there and see what happens. So our level of ignorance about about how the how DNA works and how it all connects with uh, with the rest of, of the the body and, and in terms of when a, an, an embryo is being formed is vast. We, our ignorance is is vast, and I, I don't know that we're going to quickly get on top of all that. We can poke That's and, true. And, and, and peek. Yeah, but, but I think, I think that analogy kind of fails though, David, because we we do have a lot of the source code and we're getting more of it all the time. Uh, so but I, mean, I think the most important thing to keep in mind, which is really mind blowing, is that every cell in every body has the complete DNA to build another you. That is it is important because it is packed into everything. OK, but that just blows my mind. Let me warn you, they become teenagers at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I would disagree. We don't have the source code. <laughs> the object code uh well i'm not sure i understand the analogy then okay i, I, I think what he's trying <laughs> to say is that we we understand that the, uh, the the code we can we can read the code but we don't know what the code is actually doing well uh, the, co exactly. the, co the code exactly. has no exactly. intention behind it at all it's just what evolved it's it just mm. what, what survived right it, it, I'm, I'm with paul on that yeah just a warning on that on that teenager thing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. Okay. Uh, and and you know, by the way, at that point, they no longer get any of your jokes. Uh, <laughs> that that's what hurts the most, right, Paul? Well, yeah. My daughter, <laughs> I, my daughter said to me the other day, "So why do you keep saying things that you know aren't funny?" <laughs> yeah, they're not funny to them, but they're funny to us. I go, well, they are funny, but in a meta sort of way. But you just don't get it yet. <laughs> uh, okay, Patrick, uh, we have a little time for your topic. Yeah, so um, my topic turns out, uh, as, as you have pointed out to me in episode 49, there was a deep discussion about uh, uh, data, saving data, digitizing analog data and things like that for uh, future reference and, and to save the, the memories of the human race. Um, what I want to do is I want to, you know, bring that down to, to just a general idea. Um, there's the, the episode 49 was chock full of, of great information. I mean, David and, and I forget who else was, was saying a lot of good things about, you know, the type of data being digitized stuff. What I'm, what I'm referring to more is the, just the idea of, of, of the photograph. Um, everybody wants to be remembered. I mean, from the times before photography was even created, they, they, we had the painters, the portraits, uh, people want to be remembered. So now we're talking about an entire human race, which, we know one day we will no longer be here. So millennia from now, when the sun expands into a red giant, we know. So we want to send this thing out there that 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 says, you know, this race was here. Now you're not going to put everything, everything, uh, the entire uh, uh, knowledge of the human race in, in this little probe. What you want to do is you basically send a photograph, and I, I want to compare that to the actual the two voyagers and the two pioneers plaques on the pioneers, the, the record on the voyagers. That's essentially what they are. However, these things are on a constant moving thing. They're going to, you know, in a couple million years, they're going to be, you know, who knows where they're going to be. Um, but if we were actually at the point where we knew our son was dying, and there is an episode uh, um, of, I hate to, to bring it up, but there's an episode of Star Trek, and it is called, and I'm just going to remind myself what it is right now. Um, it is called the inner light. It's a Star Trek Next Generation where um, the Enterprise came up, you know, Dr. Um, Doctor, I mean, uh, uh, Captain Picard uh, was was taken over by this flash of light, whatever uh, probe. Um, and he was only unconscious for 20 minutes, but he lived an entire lifetime in these people. They were basically, essentially they were humans. Uh, they had a little bit different face, facial features, whatever the uh, special artists uh, wanted to make them look like. But essentially they were human. 
So he lived this entire lifetime as a, as a husband and, and, a, and a father. And uh, in, in the end, uh, to make a long story short, he ended up with this flute that was actually on board this probe. Um, so essentially, it was a probe that was sent out because the star was went nova. And uh, they knew about it, and, and they wanted to send out a probe to, you know, there was a whole uh, uh, political thing on there trying to send out this probe that, that would preserve their 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 memory as a culture and they sent it out to a safe distance i guess from the star so that it won't get burned up and something to the effect of 300 years later is when the enterprise actually bumped into this thing so i, I just wanted to point out that that's basically what the 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 voyages plaques uh or rather records in the in the pioneers plaques were um but more so even carl sagan said this was a message in a bottle but it was even more for the PR. It was for the the public relations. Um, try to get people interested in science, um, and you know, even, especially Carl Sagan, because he's the one that thought of it. Uh, uh, said that this is you know not likely going to be picked up by some ET. Uh, this is more to 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 get the people interested. Um, you know, we're going to send this message out there with the, the sounds of the Earth, the 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 the, the whale songs and the and the music and the. Uh, the message from the President Carter, I think it was at the time, and things like that. But if it came to the point, millennia from now, where we are realizing our demise by some un uncontrollable astronomical thing that we know is going to happen, say, several thousand years from now, I'm sure we're going to have the technology by then to put together a message in a bottle that encompasses the general uh, uh, idea of what the human race came from all the way up to the end. And, and uh, perhaps in a half a billion years, some spacefaring uh, civilization from, from a star somewhere in our galaxy, not too far away, uh, uh, comes to investigate. And just like that Star Trek series uh, episode, um, this probe would give them this, this sort of lifetime of a single person or, or perhaps a, a community of people to let them know that yes there was a race of people here an intelligent race that has now died just just as a memory just as that photograph or that portrait that that we've had you know it's not necessarily you know like i said the, the episode 49 covered a lot of the technical stuff and, and what kind of data we save but i'm talking about generally speaking in in that that just the family thing where you want to take that photograph to remember something by and that's generally what a probe like that or or the plaque on the pioneers or or the records on the voyages really are they're this just little little photograph of this is the human race and if it should ever be found by the time we're dead somebody out there is going to find out that there was a civilization out here that's really that's the, my entire topic uh, you know, uh, the Benfords, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Benfords, it's two brothers and, and the son of one of the brothers, uh, James and Gregory Benford, and I can't remember the name of the son. Uh, I believe it's Gregory Benford, who's the, the well-known science fiction writer. Um, they have published a paper on SETI beacons, well, not SETI beacons, but MEDI beacons, uh, med messaging, in which they conjectured that one of the one of the motivations for sending out such a beacon would be saying we were here um yeah yeah, yeah the, the, the 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 kid who who cars i was here in in the, in the fresh cement on the sidewalk look that, at that. my worksheet mighty in despair uh <laughs> and uh if, if you know the the poem uh, ozymandi ozymandias uh <laughs> Where the guy's walking through ruins, right, and he sees the uh, the words, "My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look at my work, she mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains." Right. So Ozymandias, long forgotten, all his buildings collapsed into ruins, uh, and uh, but you know you you might you might see an you know, Ozymandias type of of gesture in lots of places right and, and i think i think what way we would do this we'd send it out not on a probe but we send it out at the speed of light 
Well, uh, either, either, well I, in other words, if it was going to be a probe, which I think it should be, you know, you, you send it out to orbit um, uh, way out, like maybe in the Oort cloud somewhere, or, or, you know, just send it on a trajectory where it's going to orbit the solar system where it would be safe. It would be, or, at least, or even maybe, maybe it only has to go as far as Jupiter. I don't know. You know, the sun's going to grow. It's going to engulf probably Mars. It'd probably be safe just, just outside of that orbit, you know, just so that when, when and if, I should say if and when, Either way, uh, 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 a spacefaring civilization, say in a couple million years from now, uh, decides to explore this part of the galaxy. And I say this part of the galaxy, I don't say the universe because I'm, I'm realistic. You know, I don't think there's going to be somebody from another galaxy coming. I think it's going to be from this galaxy. Um, not too far away, several light years, 100 light years, maybe, I don't know. Um, and, and spots this thing, just like it was in Star Trek. Right. It's a shame that we couldn't we couldn't put anything out that would show the elegance and the vastness and the beauty of of the earth and the people on it. There's just no way we could do that. Just like well, I think there is. I mean, I mean, the, the technology we have we sh- now, we can digitize a lot of information on a small disk uh, um, and yeah, photographs yeah. and sounds. Uh, so I'm sure in a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand years from now, you know, yeah, as uh, long as the have... playback device that was going to deliver the information was stable and and survive. Right, um, right. I mean, you know, it gets into the realm of science fiction here. I mean, in in, in the Star Trek episode, it was uh, a, a probe that that gave a beam of whatever energy, and it made a, it made a neural contact with Captain Picard, and he was unconscious. They tried to sever it, and and he went into some sort of you know, shock, and they had to keep it going. But he was only unconscious for 20 minutes, and he lived an entire lifetime. He was an old man in this civilization, in his brain anyway. Now, let me tell you this one thing, and this is the honest-to-God truth. Um, One time I had to have an operation uh, for an accident I had, and I was put under a kind of a twilight sleep. And this operation lasted for two and a half hours. And I will tell you, in two and a half hours while I was under, I lived an entire life as someone other than me, but was me. I was a man, and I picked up at that life when I went under as a young teen and lived all the way to about 60 or 70 years old. I was married with children. I had an entire life. And then when I came to, I could not shut up about it to my surgeon. I live an entire lifetime in two well, and a half I, years. I guess, I guess so this is possible. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I guess I guess the, the the writers of that Star Trek episode actually it was actually one of the most acclaimed uh, episodes in Star Trek. Um, but I, I guess the writers were were thinking of those sort of sort of lines. But or I'm, I'm only, uh, not 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 to downplay uh, your, your your experience. I'm just I just mean to use it as a as a sort of uh, idea that we humans do that. We, we have the, 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 you know, before photography, there was the portrait painters before, you know, after that there was the photography and after the photography, you know, in other words, we have that need to say, I was here to, to carve your name as a teenager in the, in the fresh cement, you know, to the, the, the Hollywood stars, you know, where you put your handprints, the, the whole, the whole thing where we have this need to say, I was here. And, you know, long after you're gone, so that you have a sort of uh, an immortality of, of sorts. And, and I think that's what it's going to be like, you know, regardless of the of the technical stuff that was talked about in episode 49, uh, regardless of the type of, of data that's saved, regardless of how much is saved, um, the idea that we just want to let somebody out there because we probably are neighbors of other civilizations, you know, the statistics says so, but... The point is, is that we hope we're hoping that somebody is going to find this and say there was a civilization here and we remember them. In the end, Captain Picard had the flute and he actually remembered how to play the flute. And he was playing it and he had several episodes after after, all episodes after that. He was always playing on that flute uh, here and there and during during his uh, rest time in his in his quarters. Okay, well, uh, uh, there's no more comments on that. Uh, Let's move on to our recommendations. Um, mine is pretty obvious. Uh, so oh yeah, I'm sorry, John John C. Buck said, "Love that episode." Yeah, I saw John's uh, comments. Uh, well, nobody calls him John, right? Buck Buckfield. He's been on the show many times. Uh, 
So let's uh, let's move on to recommendations. And um, who wants first crack at that? I can I can do it if you like. Okay. Um, I've again, it's always books with me. Uh, just a book I've been reading recently, and and when I read some time ago, I've been very interested in the uh, history of science and history of technology. And uh, I've been re reading some interesting stuff recently about the, uh, the the late 1700s, and I read a book called uh, The Lunar Men by Jenny Uglo, U G L O W. Oh yeah, very good uh, book. I've read that. Yeah, it's a great, wonderful book about about this whole group of people, including Erasmus Darwin, who was uh, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, and people like Joseph Priestley, and so on. But an, an older book I read uh, some time ago was also about that sort of period, a little bit later is uh, called The Age of Wonder by Richard Holmes. And uh, that deals with really the connection between the, um, the romantic poets of the time, people like Samuel Taylor Coleridge and so on, and, people, and, and his connection with uh, and friendship with people like Humphrey Davy uh, in the science, scientific area. So I find this whole, whole area of, of history and history of science a fascinating thing. So th th they're my two uh, recommendations, the, the Lunar Men, and uh, the age of wonder. Yeah, and I can, links. I haven't read the age of wonder. It sounds good. Uh, I would definitely endorse the lunar men. Uh, excellent book. My mother-in-law gave that to me once, think, thinking it was about space. <laughs> yeah. uh, and she hadn't read it, but it, it turned out to be about the uh, the English Enlightenment. It's really good. Uh, and yeah. it includes Ben Franklin is one of the characters in that as well. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it. It was a time when there were fewer borders between areas of knowledge and endeavor, and uh, less specialization. So, uh, well, the interesting, the interesting thing about Dar Erasmus Darwin is that he wrote this this vast series of huge long poems about evolution, basically. Yeah, it was his version of evolution before Charles's version. But you imagine a scientist today writing his results in the form of a poem. Couldn't happen, surely. No, it wouldn't, but you know what? It should. It definitely should. We got to. We got to get back to that. Uh, um, okay, uh, Chris, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, uh, just something that's come up recently. There's been a lot of interest in interstellar drives and a lot of controversy around it as well. Especially, uh, especially the stuff they're doing at NASA Eagle Works. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in that sort of area, and uh, I'm sure there's there's plenty to discuss. Laser powered uh, interstellar drives. It, it, it's just opening up at the moment. Okay. Uh, do you have a specific thing we should look at, or? Uh... Well, okay. I mean, you could look at uh, some of the work that's been done by uh, Roger Shoyer. He's a British engineer who's. Uh, Produced the EM drive. Uh, have you heard of that? Yeah, oh yeah. yes, I've heard of it. I've, I've been pretty critical right. of it too. Was it? Uh, <laughs> mm, it's yeah. been poo pooed, but it well, it, vi it violates Newton's third law, which is is, and, mm. and the calculations are not persuasive at all. So, uh, uh, absolutely, it it looks it looks dodgy, but uh, they keep sending it out to labs, and they keep finding thrust. Uh, they can't explain it. Uh, it just seems to be there. They sent it out to a lab at Dresden, which is remarkable for debunking these things. And they said, well, yeah, we're, we're seeing something. So, uh, yeah, they just need to bring it within the house of physics at the moment and find yeah. out exactly what's going on. <laughs> because the the uh, uh, the logic they got for it doesn't seem to be adding up at the moment. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, there's that. And then there's your more exotic drives, which are uh, the... Uh, Oh, the, 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 NASA, the NASA Eagle Works idea about uh, bending space so that you don't actually travel fast than the speed of light, but space travels, uh, and all you do is you go with it because space, uh, uh, space doesn't actually have mass, so it can it, it essentially move faster than the speed of light. So it, it's a you know really uh, in, incisive way of looking at this uh, problem of how to go faster than light. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how about you, Marcia? Yeah, I have. Um, I recommend a series called Orphan Black. It's a Canadian science fiction thriller it's a television series. But you can. It's been going for since 2013. But you could get it on Netflix, you know, and watch 
watch the first episode of the first year. Now, Orphan Black happens to deal a lot with cloning and with uh, transhumanism and a thing that they call neolutionism, which is the human being trying to make itself more than what it is. It's a really a fascinating, well-done series. Orphan Black um, on BBC America, or you can get it from Netflix. Okay. I, I concur. That's a great series. Uh, have we got to you, Patrick? Do you have a recommendation? Well, I'm going to cheat, but I do want to say that, yes, we know about the Orphan Black on BBC here. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to cheat. Um, the uh, NASA has actually started up again. I, I, I guess they were quiet for a while on their Juno project. Uh, uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm cheating because I think I mentioned this last time. But uh, I, I recommend that uh, you once again start following the Juno mission because uh, they are one, uh, NASA is once again um, pulling off the uh, the the cover uh, uh, about the about the project. And um, it is going to be – they're talking about actually doing the deacceleration or the maneuver on July 4th and uh, supposed to be inserting it into its orbit. So uh, I, I recommend that you follow this mission, uh, uh, NASA's uh, government we websites and, uh, um, and, other, and other places. Uh, I'm going to try to pr – um, post the, the links to my Facebook group, uh, Space Exploration Mission Followers, and things of that nature. I've posted a couple of times to, to my to my G Plus as well. But yeah, I would recommend following that. Um, I think Paul Carr has told us about the, the fact that they have a camera on there specifically for PR. Um, uh, so uh, it's it's an interesting thing, you know, to well, get Well, let's not call it PR. Let's space. call it PO, public outreach. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, to get excited about space exploration again and uh, to... to uh, so go ahead and follow that mission now. They're 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 starting to take off the uh, canvas, uh, starting to take off the camouflage to uh, to once again talk about it because it was launched. By the way, I found out uh, it was uh, 2011. I think it was. Makes sense. And uh, um, it you know took several years to get there, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into details right now. But uh, definitely you can you can go to the NASA website about Juno and. Uh, and find out the exact details and when it was launched, how it how it swung around the Earth a couple of times in, in in a matter of a year and a half or two, and uh, and on its way to Jupiter. Yeah, one, so one of the bold is. things about Juno that they did was uh, kind of out of necessity, but uh, they decided to make it a solar powered mission, which out yeah, of, which out which out at Jupiter is uh, non trivial to pull off. Right, and, and there was a whole thing about about the fact that they chose to put a microwave uh, uh, transmitter on it and. And and the idea of using solar power to power this microwave transmitter is like, wait a minute, is there enough power there? You know. Well, the but pretty much all satellites have microwave transmitters on them. Uh, but uh, yeah, they 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 had to be very uh, very very tight on the power budget. And, right. Right. And they've done it. Uh, it looks like it's going to work. Uh, these are very big solar panels for the small satellite that yes, they have. Yes, yes. Cross your fingers. <laughs> well, they're they're out there deploying. They're producing power, so they're, they're yeah, doing well. Yeah. So, so uh, it's I, very I don't, exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah. We're going to find out a lot more about Jupiter and uh, et cetera. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So um, okay, my recommendation should be pretty obvious to those who've been following the Wow Signal for the last couple of weeks, and that is. Uh, not so much a recommendation, more of a, a begging or a pleading, or uh, maybe I'm trying to shame you into doing this. But I want, I'd like everybody to go to a Kickstarter site called The Most Mysterious Star in the Galaxy. It's a Kickstarter that was initiated by none other than Tabitha Boyajian. And it's to buy telescope time to monitor the what's been coming informally known as Tabby Star or uh, is more formally known as KIC 8462852. Uh, don't remember that. Just remember Tabby Star. Uh, and uh, named after, obviously, Dr. Boyajan herself, who led the research into the star. And what they're trying to do is buy time on a network of telescopes to keep constant vigil on the brightness of the star to see when it and the brightness dims again as it has been observed on the by the Kepler Space Telescope. I've got lots more information about that in the Wow Signal 
uh, if you go to wowsignalpodcast.com, uh, I won't try to read to you the Kickstarter URL over uh, an audio because it's too complex, but I'll put it in the show notes at unseenpodcast.com. Okay, um, that's it for episode 52. We covered SpaceX. We covered yeah. uh, simulations. We covered CRISPR. We covered... Um, what did we cover with you, Patrick? I'm trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> Putting handprints in cement. Oh, right, right, right. Handprints in cement. Uh, Kilgore was here. Right. Uh, and um, so uh, for any more information on this episode or any other episode of the other 51 episodes, go to unseenpodcast.com. Every episode there has its own blog entry. We also, if you click on the episodes tab, you'll get a complete set of links to all the episodes uh, all 52 of them as of now. And uh, we will be back in two weeks with episode 53. The topic is not decided yet. So um, it might be Bitcoin-y, but maybe not. So let, let's, uh, you know, if you have ideas of what topics we should cover or who we, you know, if we should have special guests on the show, by all means, send us an email at unseenpodcast at gmail.com. You can go on to the blog at unseenpodcast.com and comment on each episode. We also have a listener's forum on Google Plus, and we have a listener's subreddit on Reddit. We also, you can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Unseen. So your feedback is encouraged and welcome, and will be taken into consideration. The other thing is that if you would like to be on the panel for the Unseen Podcast, this is an open participation podcast. So all you have to do is send an email to unseenpodcast at gmail.com or go over to our website and every, everything there is explained in the FAQ. So if, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And all, everything that we've talked about tonight We'll have links in the show notes at unseenpodcast.com. We welcome your comments as long as it's not telling us about how we can get free, Apple, free essays for our college courses uh, <laughs> or, or drugs or whatever. Uh, but, yes, we do get a lot of spam comments, but those are quickly dispensed with. So, folks, uh, we hope to hear from you. Uh, we hope that some of you will agree to be on our uh, future panels. We, we welcome panelists from all backgrounds and you don't have to be a technical expert on a particular subject. You just have to have good questions and if you have questions about the questions feel free to ask. We'll help, we'll help you get there. Um, so we'll see you in two weeks episode 53 and this has been episode 52. It is the 27th of May 2016 and uh, David has already left because he had to go early but I'd like to thank our new panelist Chris Prophet cheers and Thanks, Marcia Barnhart thank you and goodbye from beautiful northern Michigan and Patrick Festa thank you again and Chris it's been a pleasure meeting you okay yes. And don't forget the book. I think you'll find a lot of stuff that's real eye-opening in there yeah, if I, you get a chance. I, I, hope, okay. I hope show notes so that I can I can look it up. I'll put, I plan okay. to acquire a copy. So yeah, send me a link, Chris, and we'll we'll get it into the show notes. Uh, mm. And uh, so that's it. It's episode fifty-two of the Unseen Podcast, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Good night.